40 years ago today, one of our area's biggest signs of solidarity and celebration played out in northeastern Pennsylvania. It was the day in 1981 when we celebrated the end of the Iran hostage crisis and the return of two of our own. Bruce German and Michael Matrinko had just survived 444 days in captivity. Bruce grew up in Edwardsville. Michael was a native of Oliphant. Bruce died about a year ago, but tonight, 40 years after his release from captivity, Michael Matrinko takes us back to this scene in Oliphant, a time when his hometown gathered to celebrate his return after he lived through a nightmare that lasted for 444 days in Iranian prisons. Michael's release and welcome home celebration brought out thousands. Students had the day off from school. Many people left work early. A nation's prayers were answered. 52 American hostages set free. It's a very dramatic story, and we want to let you know it also includes some strong language. And tonight, this self-described private man, Michael Matrinko, who rarely speaks to reporters about his time in captivity, invited Newswatch 16's Ryan Lecky to his Pennsylvania home. It's here where he opened up about that frightful, life-changing day, November 4th, 1979, when Iranians stormed the U.S. Embassy and took him and 51 others hostage. Now, here's Ryan Leckie with this emotional one-on-one -on -one interview with the former hostage. Michael just got out of the car. The world almost never got to know Michael Matrinko of Oliphant as one of the 52 people captured during the Iran hostage crisis. The last of our three area men to arrive here, Michael Matrinko. That's because Michael was not even supposed to be at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran on that day, November 4th, 1979, when 52 Americans were taken hostage by militarized Iranian college students. On a typical day back in the 1970s, Michael was usually out on the streets of Tehran, meeting people. Part of his job as a political officer, well, it meant getting to know the locals and what was happening in the town. Today, we'd call this networking. You have to be out walking the streets, talking to people, meeting with people, going out, drinking with them, dining with them. Normally, I would be out all night or out until two or three or four in the morning. Because of curfews, Michael would often end up sleeping at a friend's house. During this time, he was in his 30s, working out of the U.S. Embassy after hundreds of Americans had already fled the country. Things were already getting very unpleasant there. After all, the late 1970s was a time when many in Iran hated the United States, all because of America's refusal to deport Iran's ousted ruler, the Shah, who was in New York City to receive treatment for cancer. Back in Iran, a revolution was gaining momentum under the Ayatollah Khomeini. In November of 1979, emotions boiled over, and Michael, a typical night owl, got an unusual request. Friends of mine had called me and they asked me if I could be at the embassy in the morning on November 4th. You know, we really have to see, it's very important. I said, what about the afternoon? No, 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 it has to be in the morning, Michael. We have to see you, you know, around nine o'clock or so. What they said was, we're going off to Lebanon. We have a, you know, we're gonna go and see Yasser Arafat and we want to talk to you before we go to see him. Well, when someone tells you they're going off to meet the head of another major political movement in another country, and the people telling you this are also major political figures in the country where you are, you don't pass up the opportunity. So Michael went to the embassy on the morning of November 4th, 1979, but those friends never showed up. That's when I knew that they had screwed me. And as Michael waited for the friends who never came. People started to jump over walls and suddenly the embassy property was filled with thousands and thousands of people. Walk me through what that looked like and what it felt like and sounded like. Lots of noise and then, hmm, there's a, an increased rumbling. We still weren't a huge embassy. There were maybe 65 Americans in it, if that. You had sounds that shouldn't be, you know, things crashing. Or, and then Marines saying, you know, everybody, you know, leave your offices, get away from the windows. And we were being directed to what had been the ambassador's suite. While Michael and the others tried to rush to safety, another group of Americans sprinted to the embassy's communication room where classified documents were kept. They were, went down there and started to destroy things very quickly, but it was too late. It's amazing how long it takes paper to burn when you want to burn it. 
Iranian student protesters started taking over the embassy. We surrendered the embassy officially. And where did they take you? Over to the ambassador's residence and then the next day to a larger building where we were, you know, just all laying on the floor, still tied up. And that was the last time I saw any American. But while they're walking you from one building to another building, did you think they're going to kill me? I was angry. Anger doesn't allow you to think about being killed. When you're angry, you're angry. And you don't care about consequences. Were you part of the mock executions? No. I never even knew that happened until I read about it later. I was in handcuffs or zip ties a lot. It's unpleasant. Handcuffed and often blindfolded, Michael says he spent many days living in his own filth. I was in hardcore prisons on concrete floors with, you know, no windows and just little air holes. But I was alone the whole time, too. So I was in solitary from November of 1979 until May, I think, of, 19, of 1980. The room that I was in for a long time was exactly the size of a single mattress. You know, a single, you know, mattress for a cot. Michael and the rest of the hostages spent 444 days in captivity. I saw some reports you drew shapes on the wall. Yeah, you know, I'm 74 and I still do this in order to fall asleep. And he thought about escaping. If I'm going to get out of this, if I have to run someday to get out of here, I'd better be in very good physical shape. So I started, you know, a huge program of exercise. What did you do? I run in place for, you know, hours a day. I got up to a thousand sit-ups a day. Even assuming that I could get out, I was in prison clothes. Or I was in a pair of pants that were held together by a staple at this point. Considering how much Michael was moved around while in captivity, he says he rarely saw or even knew the 51 other American hostages. Did you think you were going to die there? You know, I didn't care. I just did it day by day. At one point, Michael was brought before an Iranian leader who he gave a piece of his mind to since he could speak the native language, Farsi. You spoke up and you said the conditions you're treating us are worse than animals and what happened after yeah, that? I was warned beforehand that if I said anything at all that I'd be punished for it and I was. What kind of punishment? You know, at this point, I don't even remember. I just know that I paid for it. <laughs> Often roughed up, bruised, and isolated, Michael and the 51 other hostages did what they could to survive. All while then-President Jimmy Carter continued to try to negotiate their release. The U.S. even attempted a covert rescue operation. The botched effort became another downfall in Carter's administration after America's own military aircraft collided with each other in an Iranian desert. Michael's release eventually came on January 20th, 1981, as President Ronald Reagan took office. Michael remembers that ride to freedom. Are they taking us to the airport? He was a guard in the bus, yelled out, and in Farsi he said, you American bastards. I simply responded in Farsi in a loud voice. I said, shut up yourself, you son of an Iranian whore. And he got offended. So he hauled me off the bus and the guards beat me up again and the bus left. At this point, I'm thinking, dumb move. Lucky for Michael, another group of Iranians showed up and shoved him into a car. I left in a Mercedes Benz in the back seat. And I just thought, this is the only way to leave this city is in a Mercedes Benz. Michael Matrenko has just gotten out of the car. Fast forward to January 28th, 1981. Michael finally arrived back in northeastern Pennsylvania, greeted by thousands of people as he made his way into his hometown in Lackawanna County. How did that feel knowing the whole country was just praying for your return? Heavy. Very heavy. Right now, I can't recall the emotion of 40 years ago, but it was very emotional. I've heard some people said sometimes you didn't want the attention when you came back to Oliphant like that. You weren't happy with the parade or... No, it wasn't that. You can't take someone out of solitary confinement and face them with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It was a shock. Yeah, very much so. You can't change temperatures that quickly. Things break. It was the constant attention. I'm a private person. Were you in the CIA? No, never. CIA has its own people. I was in the Peace Corps, the Department of State. But never in the CIA? No. Have I worked with the CIA? Yes, at various times. 
because we're colleagues at the embassy. Now at 74 years old, Michael spends his time volunteering, teaching immigrants conversational English in the Carlisle area. His life of foreign service is spelled out in art all over the walls of his home. And a sketch of you, welcome home, Michael. Yeah, from the Scranton Times. You know, by the time I go, I want the place to be empty. It's why Michael continues to donate countless pieces of art from all over the Middle East to his alma mater. Scranton Prep, it had all those bare walls. <laughs> and I figured, why not give the art to the school? The 1964 graduate hopes the art, now at Prep, and even the American flag that flew over the White House upon his return, inspire students to reach for more and learn from other cultures, like he did being raised in Oliphant. I grew up in a multi-generational family. Artists see the world in a different way than politicians do. The world is changing. It's changing all around us. It is no longer a white Christian world. It's a multicolor, multi-gender, multi-ethnic, and you know, great. I'm all for it. Now, Michael is living in isolation again this time by a pandemic. But he looks to the future and he points out to us what he calls the good that came during his 444 days in captivity. I learned all about myself. I knew what I could do, what I couldn't do. I knew what my weaknesses were. I had a lot of time to think about this. Something he almost relives each morning in his kitchen. This is the mug that I used in prison. Unbreakable, nice size, bright color. And it's a reminder that things can always change for the worse or for the better. Now, 40 years after those infamous 444 days in captivity came to an end, Michael still has hope that things will continue to change for the better for all of us. I'm Ryan Leckie, Newswatch 16.